and welcome to the latest episode of Crad COVID Readings. I'm Keith Ari DeCandido, doing my bit to calm the coronavirus craziness by reading my writings. Um, excuse me. Several uh, of the stories that I have read throughout this reading series are urban fantasy stories set in Key West, the tales of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. I have actually read all but three of them at this point, um, and they happen to be the three uh, latest stories in terms of the chronology. They're not the most three I've, recent three I've written, but they're the most three most recent chronologically speaking in terms of story structure. Um, I'm actually working on the next story after these three, uh, which is called Ragnarok in a Hard Place, which will also be the title of the next collection I do of Cassie's stories, uh, which will be all the stuff I've written since 2013 when Ragnarok and Roll came out. Anyway, um... So for this week, uh, the theme is going to be those last three stories, um, starting today with Fish Out of Water, uh, which was published in Out of Tune, which is uh, one of two anthologies that were edited by Jonathan Mayberry and published by Journalstone. Um, and these two anthologies all feature stories that are inspired by old ballads. Um, in my particular case, the story was inspired by um, the Mermaid Ballad, uh, one of the child ballads. Uh, which was a perfect opportunity to write a, uh, a Cassie story because scuba diving and all that other good stuff. Although, there's also Norse gods involved because, duh. Um, it's Child Ballad number 289, I can remember the number. Um, and uh, there's, there's several different versions of it, uh, but it all involves um, uh, a crew of a ship finding a mermaid and what happens after that. Anyhow, uh, without further ado, here is Fish Out of Water, a tale of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. I knew something was wrong when I saw the 28-foot Coast Guard boat coming toward us. I cut back on the throttle to slow us down. It wasn't a collision course, but if the Coasties were coming this way, going the way they came might not be such a hot idea. It was a response boat small, one of the new Defiant class, and if an RBS was here, it probably meant something and or someone went missing at sea. After double-checking the code painted on the other boat's hull, I grabbed the radio. USCG 25119, USCG 25119, this is Groucho on 16, over. Groucho, this is 119, over. I recognized the tinny voice that squawked over the radio as bosun's mate first class, Cole Howard, who worked out of the USCG station located on Marathon Key. 119, Groucho, wasn't expecting you guys out here, uh, something we can help with? Groucho 119, thanks very much. Uh, don't suppose you've seen Saliato? It's a wreck boat that usually launches from the Azucar dive. I interrupted before he could start describing a boat I already knew quite well. Cole, it's Cassie. Have those jackasses gone missing again? Over Thanksgiving weekend, boats from the Azucar diving shop up on Big Pine Key had gone missing twice. In fact, Cole was the one who found them the second time. Groucho 119, that's affirmative. Formal as ever was Cole. Last radio contact was at 1100 hours. Then he got less formal and more skeptical and sardonic. When he added, said they saw a mermaid. Last time they said it was the Loch Ness Monster. So at least they were getting more local. On the other hand, I numbered among my close friends and acquaintances the ghost of a wrecker captain, an immortal barfly, and four Norse gods. So I really wasn't in any position to poo-poo someone who said they sighted a mermaid. Or Nessie. 119 Groucho, I've got six tourists who really want to dive Pickles Reef. Okay if I proceed there? Groucho 119, that is in our search pattern, but not for a bit. Proceed as planned, but be advised that we've received reports of an odd storm front over that way. Nothing on the radar, but a few boats radioed in tornado warnings. That didn't make sense on any level. For starters, I checked the weather before we came out, and for another... 119 Groucho, those boats do know that we're in the Florida Keys, right? We don't generally get tornadoes. Groucho 119, wanted to mention it just in case. Good sailing. You too, out. I thumbed the radio off and hit the throttle, zipping around the RBS. The half-dozen tourists who had come to the Sea Clips dive shop on Stock Island and hired me to take them scuba diving were a bunch of martial artists from a dojo in Denver, visiting Key West for the week. The woman who seemed to be the ringleader, a short, lithe Filipino woman named Isabel, all the others called her Senpai Bell, poked her head into Groucho's tiny bridge. Everything okay? Yeah, just touching base with the Coast Guard about a dive boat that's gone missing. I filled her in on what happened. So, good thing you went with us instead of Azucar. Belle smiled and shook her head. Our kaicho told us we should try Azucar, but it was too far up the keys. We wanted somewhere closer to Old Town. Don't usually go against his wishes, but damn. Anyhow, we'll be at Pickles Reef in no time. 
Can I ask you something, Ms. Zukov? Kaicho told us that the reef was named for the pickle barrels at the ocean floor. What he didn't tell us was why the barrels were left there. My bosses at Seaclips didn't warn me when I took the part-time job as dive master last year that the job description included playing tour guide for the entirety of South Florida, but I quickly became quite the expert on the history and trivia of the Keys. So many ships got wrecked on the reefs around here for centuries, there's no way to get everything back above water. And these barrels are full of concrete, so hauling them up would be a major pain. No one's really sure where they came from. It might be a wreck, it might be a construction project gone bad. They used to think it was the concrete used to construct the forts that they started to build during the Civil War, but they did an analysis a few years back that shows that it was a type of concrete made between 1890 and 1925. It might have been for the railroad they built through the Keys. What railroad? I smiled. You guys drove down from Miami, right? Bell nodded. Flying into Key West International Airport was often more expensive than flying into Miami International Airport and renting a car. That had the added bonus of getting to drive on Route 1 through almost all of the Keys, which is some of the most scenic driving you'll ever see. The overseas highway is mostly on what used to be the railroad that went from Miami to Key West. It opened in 1912 and closed down after it got hammered by a hurricane in 1935. They built the road over the same right of way. I shrugged. Anyhow, I'd rather they focused on cleaning up the actual litter that people throw down there. There's so much, uh, so much crap down there. Smiling, she said, it's okay, Ms. Zukov, you can say shit. I laughed. Sorry. First dive I ran, I made the mistake of saying fuck in front of some Southern Baptists. Had to give them their money back. As a general, I cut myself off when I caught sight of a boat in the water ahead of us. It wasn't on our exact course, but we passed pretty close. I was running a dive flag, the red flag with the white diagonal stripe that's become the universal sign for a boat filled with divers. But the motor was silent and was bouncing around in the ocean as if it wasn't anchored. Squinting at the boat, Bell asked, should we let that Coast Guard guy know? Let's make sure they're okay first, I said, as I changed Groucho's course toward the dive boat, which looked more and more like Soleado the closer I got. First time they went missing last weekend, it was another one of their boats that found them, but BM1 Howard found them the second time. He let them off once with just a warning, which means he's going to rip several new... I smiled at Bell, reveling in my newfound permission to speak freely. Assholes this time. Probably close the shop for a major inspection and whatever else he can do to make their lives a living hell. Giving me a questioning look, Bell asked... So you're going to let them off? There are about 18 reasons why they might have gone quiet, starting with the radio breaking down. Cell phones? Reception can be spotty out here. They also could be damaged in some other way that's not their fault. I'd rather not stick the coasties on them until we know for sure they deserve it. Like the song says, we look after our own. I pulled up alongside the boat that had the word Soleado stenciled on its bow. Mind giving me a hand? With the help of my very able-bodied tourists, I was able to tether Soleado to Groucho, then drop anchor so we'd all stay in one place for Cole to find us if we needed it. Groucho wasn't rated for towing, so if they were damaged, we'd still need to help from the Coasties, but I wanted to know what was happening first. Besides, it could have actually been a mermaid. Since moving to Key West, I dealt with a dragon, several different water fae, a half dozen ghosts, what's left of the Norse pantheon, the spirit of the Calusa tribe, and a UFO on Dry Tortugas. I figured it would be best to make sure it was something that the mundanes could handle before I called them in. Okay, the Norse pantheon remnants I mentioned, I'm one of them. While I was born of Midgard, as my friend Ginny, aka Sigyn, put it, I'm actually a Norse fate goddess, one of the Desir. As a Dis, I tend to attract weird-ass shit, and sometimes I can even deal with the weird-ass shit. Cole was way too straight and arrow to handle an actual mermaid without his head exploding, so I needed to do triage on Soleado first. Mind you, I had no idea if there actually were mermaids. I only found out it was a Dece seven months ago, and it didn't come with an instruction manual. Once we secured the other boat, I jumped across to their deck. Soleado was a 29-footer, just like ours, though it was made by a different company, so there were variations in design. However, the basics were the same. Bridge four, deck aft, galley and head below. I didn't see anyone in either of the former two places, so I climbed down below decks to find five people, all standing crammed into the galley. They were all wearing some dive paraphernalia, but nobody was fully geared up, and nobody was fully ungeared up either. One guy had a single fin on one foot, one wore a regulator but no mask, one had half his neoprene suit off. It was like they had all been interrupted in mid-prep and came down here. I stared at the one person I knew, Al Martinez, one of the dive, master, dive masters at Azucar. He was the one wearing only a single fin. Al, you okay? What happened? I got a wife back in Tampa and two kids. 
Ain't gonna be seeing her no more. I frowned. Al? The Asian couple crammed in on either side of Al, then each said something in what I think was Korean. At the very least, it sounded like how my Korean neighbors back in La Jolla always sounded when they chatted in their native tongue. After they said their piece, the other two, a couple of brunettes who looked like who looked related, probably sisters, spoke up. My fiancé's back in Ann Arbor. We'll never get to be married. My husband's waiting for me in Chicago. He'll be a widower. I blinked. Even by my standards, this was weird. Belle called from the deck. She had followed me across, apparently. Everything okay, Ms. Zukov? Let me get back to you on that. I reached out to the dive master. Hey, Al, it's me, Cassie, from Sea Clips. Let's get you guys out of here, okay? But Al didn't move. He just said, I got a wife back in Tampa and two kids. Ain't gonna be seeing, them, seeing her no more. That started the whole litany again. First the Asian couple, then the sisters. Hesitantly, I grabbed Al's arm by the neoprene and tugged a bit, but he refused to budge. I felt like there was something else I should do. This had all the earmarks of a spell cast over them but my knowledge of spellcraft was limited to the fact that I was able to cast one if someone spent the better part of a day showing me how, and I only did that once. I needed to know a hell of a lot more before I could try to cast a counterspell, and by a hell of a lot more, I meant something. I hopped back up onto the deck, asked Bell to keep an eye on the creepy quintet in the galley, and radioed Cole. Once the RBS showed up, I untied Groucho and took the paying customers on to Pickles Reef, leaving Cole to handle Al and his clients. Belle and her friends paid for a reef dive, and they got a reef dive. Since there was an even number of divers, I stayed on the boat while they dove, since you always go down in pairs. No certified diver would ever go down alone, and no reputable dive shop would ever let anyone go down alone. Had I been in the mood, I could have been a third for one of the pairs, but these guys had some kind of teamwork bond stuff going on, so I let them do their thing. I was fondling my smartphone when a call came in from BM1 Cole Howard's cell. I smiled and hit answer. Hey Cole, what's up? Just thought you'd want to know. We uh, got Martinez and his customers out of the galley. They're on the RBS now. They just keep doing the same thing over and over again, talking about who they left behind at home. You got a Korean speaker on board? Yeah, me. I could hear Cole smirk from here. They were saying how they were going to leave their three kids orphans. And the boat was clean. No drugs, nothing untoward at all. All we found was a cooler full of non-alcoholic drinks, the first aid stuff, dive equipment, and three iPads covered in waterproof casings. I chuckled. One of Seclipse's biggest sellers were the waterproof casings that allowed you to bring your smartphone or tablet underwater with you so you could take pictures with it. Those actually sold better than the disposable underwater cameras. As a veteran phone fondler, I totally got why people didn't want to be separated from their devices and wanted to have their underwater pics right there at their fingertips. But I never risked taking my phone down with me. Then again, I had a ridiculously expensive 14 megapixel underwater camera. Well, take them back to Marathon, drop them at the Fisherman's Hospital, let the docs there give them a full once-over. Okay. Hey, Cole, thanks for filling me in. He snorted. <laughs> if I didn't, you'd have called me in an hour to bug me. Yeah, yeah. I tried and failed to sound offended. Cole knew me too well. You ever gonna get your tight ass to me or friends? Call me when they hire a blues band. Bye. The dive went, you'll pardon the expression, swimmingly. My martial artist had a grand old time swimming around the reefs, the pickle barrels, and the pillar corals. They also frolicked with the blue angelfish and watched the spiny lobsters crawl on the barrels. I learned about all these things from the breathless descriptions provided by Belle's husband, aided by the pictures from Belle's tablet. Nicely covered in a waterproof casing, she bought at Seclipse. Belle promised to email me the link to the pictures when she uploaded them. That night, as was my wont, I wandered over to Mayor Fred's saloon. I lived and also worked part-time at the Botroff House Bed and Breakfast, located on Eaton Street, just off Duval in Old Town. Mayor Fred's was a couple of blocks away on Green Street, built around a big ficus tree. Tourist websites will tell you that it was Key West's hanging tree in the 19th century. They won't tell you that it's also a root of Yggdrasil, the world tree of Norse myth. I was always there to see my friends in the band 1812 play on Thursday through Sunday. Of course, it was Wednesday, so the bar was less crowded, and also the music was provided not by a four-piece band on the main stage of the back, but by an acoustic act over near the entrance. I didn't recognize the person playing guitar, but I remembered Ihor, the bartender, telling me that the two guys with beards, whose names I could never remember, got a gig at a place up in Key Largo. The new guy was a painfully thin, absurdly pale, tall guy with a hook nose and long, stringy brown hair. He also had a lovely voice. He was singing Scarborough Fair and doing it justice, and he played his battered old Yamaha acoustic guitar quite skillfully. The guitar had ver stickers from various cities on it, making it look like a tourist suitcase from 1957. 
I did recognize one of the people at the bar, though. Larry, who was the textbook definition of regular. Every single day, from the moment Mayor Fred's opened at midday to the second it closed at 4 a.m., Larry was at that bar, guzzling a coffee or a soda. He was the immortal barfly I listed among my acquaintances before, and he got that way by falling in love with a water elemental and then leaving her. As soon as he falls asleep, he'll die, hence the all-caffeine-all-the-time diet. But until he falls asleep, he'll continue to live. He spent eternity to date at Mayor Fred's, going back to when Hemingway was a regular. I had no idea where he went from 4 to 11 in the morning, though I figured he must live somewhere. Someday, I'd ask. What's the word, Cassie? He asked me as I sat next to him. I took a deep breath and then let it out in a single burst. <sighs> Weird, was the word I finally agreed on. Larry laughed. I was the first person to answer Larry's rather old-fashioned greeting with an actual word, and it had become our thing. I'd ask what's weird in your life, but I'm not convinced we'll have enough time for that. Yeah, well, I had a doozy on the afternoon dive. After I told Larry the story of Al Martinez and the Soleado, he got a faraway look in his eyes. Wow, that takes me back. This was interesting. Back to what? He waved a hand around. Eh, about a hundred years, give or take. He patted the pocket of his shirt to make sure his pack of cigarettes was in it. Come on outside, I need to smoke. Florida state law actually allowed smoking in bars, but you still couldn't smoke in Mayor Fred's. Ehor, who was both the night bartender and the general manager, had asthma and reacted very badly to secondhand smoke, so he had to ban smoking in order to not collapse in a wheezing heap while doing his job. To Larry's credit, he remained loyal to Mayor Fred's even after the smoking ban went into effect and stuck around, rather than patronize one of the other gajillion bars on the island that would let him suck nicotine where he sat. Of course, that didn't stop him from complaining about it all. I followed him out under the giant fish over the main entrance up to the Green Street sidewalk where he lit up. Back around, oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I can't remember the damn dates exactly, but it was definitely in the 20s, because I do remember that Harding was president. In any case, I used to spend my leisure hours in an exclusive cigar club down on Flagler. There was a fellow named Reuben. He chuckled. <laughs> Reuben the Cuban, we called him. He sailed up from Havana and opened up one of the cigar factories. He and I would play cribbage over brandy and cigars. Holding up a hand, I said, wait, Brandy? I thought Harding was president during Prohibition. Larry just chuckled. Letter of the law, sure, booze was illegal, but around here, that didn't mean a hill of beans. Treasury Department never really got down this far south, and when they did, they took the railroad, so we knew they were coming. At my confused look, he added, tickets had a note on them that said they were employees of the federal government. So if one boarded a train to Key West, the conductor would get on the wire and warn all the, all the speaks to hide their booze. <laughs> didn't realize you were such an outlaw. Drinking brandy with my friend didn't make me an outlaw. It just made me another person on the island. He shook his head. Now you've turned my head around with all this foolishness. What were we talking about? Reuben the Cuban, I prompted. Right, right. So Reuben loved to fish and kept needling me to come along with him. After what happened with Anne, I wasn't all that tickled to go out to sea, but he finally wore me down by making a wager out of it. Anne was the name of his water fay ex used when she was in human form. He went on. If I lost a cribbage, I'd fish with him. If I won, he'd give me a box of his factory's finest. I smiled. I take it you lost or there wouldn't be a story. He looked at me as he took a puff. You know, that smart mouth of you is yours is going to get you in Dutch one of these days. I think it's cute that you believe it hasn't already. So what happened on the fishing trip? Taking a longer drag on his cigarette, he inhaled, paused, and exhaled a puff of smoke before finally answering me. All right, I don't want to be unkind to Reuben, rest his soul, but... That was one of the most boring afternoons of my life. Given how long your life has been, that's saying something. You said it. He shook his head. After we whiled away most of the day without a single bite, we finally hauled anchor and went back home. And that's when we saw it. At first we thought it was a sea lion. At least until, as God is my witness, I saw a woman's head. It looked like she was in trouble, so I dove into the water with one of the cork vests. The life preserver? I asked in surprise. We had ten inflatable donuts on each of the dive shops. Not like what you're thinking. Those got invented later. Back then, we just had a couple of cork vests, and I swam out to put one on the lady so we could rescue her. Except she didn't need rescuing. She swam under me and came under Reuben's boat. I was about 50 yards away when I realized she'd snuck past me, so I turned around to double back. I only got a few glimpses, but... Well, it sure as shooting looked like a mermaid. Woman's head, long tail, and the body was scaly and strange. Reminded me a little of Anne's true form, to be honest. Only got a gander at her like that once, but it was a doozy. I nodded. As a dece, I'm immune to disguises of any kind, so I only saw Larry's ex in her true, seaweed-encrusted, yucky form. He was lucky to only get the one gander. 
I did get, catch a glimpse of something peculiar. It was beautiful that day, sky blue as a marble, not a cloud to be seen. But for a few minutes, the sky changed. It went all green. And I spent some time in Kansas back in the day, and I'd seen the sky turn that color right before a twister. But down here in Florida? Never seen the like. Never so sudden. He took a final puff, then dropped the cigarette onto the sidewalk and stepped on it. By the time I got to the boat, though, the sky was normal and she was gone. And Reuben, he was just sitting there, carrying on to the nines about his brother back home in Cuba and how he wasn't ever going to see him again. He wouldn't move. He barely blinked. He just sat around like a lump. And every time I tried to talk to him, he was just a broken record about his brother. This was all sounding annoyingly familiar. Also, the tornado warning Cole told me about was sounding less far-fetched all of a sudden. Then what happened? Well, I managed to steer the boat back to shore, but it wasn't easy, since I hadn't been on a boat in decades. Reuben wasn't ever the same after that. Eventually, he became more himself, but we only spoke a few more times here and there. He lost interest in the club, and cribbage, and drinking, and eventually even in work. He sold the factory, moved back to Havana, and I never saw him again. His cigarette done, Larry headed back inside under the giant fish. I followed him, and as I entered, I heard the guitar player start his next song with the words... One Friday morn as we set sail in a ship not far from land, we there did espy a fair mermaid with a comb and a glass in her hand. I did a double take as I was walking toward the bar and stopped suddenly. Unfortunately, a tourist was walking from toward the restroom from the bar and crashed right into me, spilling his beer. I apologized and offered to buy him a new one, but he muttered that it was okay and kept going to the men's room. As I sat down at the bar where a pint of beer was waiting for me, it's good to be a regular, I caught, I caught the rest of the song and was even more freaked out. Then up spoke the captain of our gallant ship, who at once did our peril see. I have married a wife in fair London town, and tonight she'll a widow be. And then up spoke the little cabin boy, and a fair-haired boy was he. I have a father and a mother in fair Portsmouth town, and this night she will weep for me. I wound up gulping down two-thirds of the pint at once. After he finished the song, he said, And now I take a pause. If you enjoyed what you heard, please make your pleasure known. With that, he held up the tip jar on the stool in front of him. Surprisingly, he had no CDs for sale, no cards listing his website or anything like that. I approached him as he put his Yamaha in the case. What was that last song? It's called The Wrecked Ship. Wrecked Ship, excuse me. Based on an old sea shanty, I think. Always loved that one. Yeah. A few days passed. I didn't hear anything new about mermaids or boats going missing or tornado warnings or people muttering about the people they left back home. I did hear that Al Martinez quit Azucar to move back to Tampa. The owner of Azucar told me that right before he tried to poach me from Sea Cliffs, a request that I rejected, though it was flattering. If nothing else, it gave me leverage to bug my bosses for a raise. Didn't know what happened to the four tourists who jammed into the galley with Al, but a little Google foo revealed more about Ruben the Cuban. His real name was Ruben Hernandez, Jr., owner of the prosaically named Hernandez Cigar Factory on Front Street. He sold it in 1922, when Warren Harding really was president, and he moved back to Cuba. The new owners of the factory kept the name until it was badly damaged by the Labor Day hurricane in 1935, same one that took out the railroad, actually, and it shut down for good. Unsurprisingly, I found nothing online that mentioned that Hernandez saw a mermaid. Still, the details I could find matched Larry's story. I also did a bit of research into mermaid legends, though there was a lot of stuff from a lot of different regions and not much to match what I'd heard from Beyond the Song, what I'd heard Beyond the Song the guy at Mayor Fred's did. I was amused to read that Christopher Columbus made references to seeing mermaids in his journals written during his infamous sea voyage of 1492, though some modern folk assume that he and his crew saw, really saw manatees or rays and were just really hard up for sexual companionship. None of my dives took me anywhere near Pickles Reef until the following Monday, when the South Dakota seafarers came back to the Keys. The SDS were a bunch of retirees who got together to do various water-related things, and every three months or so, a group of them came down here. This quarter, I got five of them, and they had their hearts set on diving the wreck of the Duane, a coasty ship that was deliberately sunk back in the 80s to create an artificial reef. Wreck divers love the Duane, so I usually wind up going there at least twice a month. We headed there in Chico this time, on a partly cloudy day with decent winds. Not enough to make the water choppy, thankfully. Then the sky turned green. For a second, I thought I imagined it. The sky just went from blue and white to an emerald green instantly, and then it changed back just as fast. Before I even had time to process this, or figure out how to answer the inevitable questions from a quintet of senior citizens as to what the hell was going on, 
I saw a 125-foot gaff-rigged schooner hauling ass across our path. They were at full sail and poodling along at about eight knots or so. Frowning, I double-checked the charts and realized that they were heading straight for a shallow reef, and if they didn't change course in about 30 seconds, they were going to crash right into it. Then I caught sight of the logo on the side and realized it was the Lily, a local schooner that did intimate little cruises for small parties in and around the Bahamas and the Keys. Her captain was Meg Michaels, and she wasn't usually batshit crazy. In fact, the last time I talked to her was about a month ago when she came back from a triumphant second place finish in the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race, and a bunch of us, including all 12 of her crew, got seriously drunk at Mayor Fred's to celebrate. I snagged the radio. Chico calling Schooner Lily. Come about. You're about to kind of hit a reef. Meg, it's Cassie. You there? I shook my head. Fuck! I hit the throttle even though I knew I wasn't going to make it in time. I always used to make fun of TV shows and movies where they'd go into slow motion when something bad happens. After watching Lily slam into the reef, I stopped doing that. It took maybe a second and a half for it to go from full bore through the ocean to jutting at an angle up out of the water with a big-ass hole in the hull, but watching it felt like at least a full minute. After sending out a general distress call, which would bring Cole and his buddies out here, as well as any other boats in the area, I set course for what was now a wreck. Just like with Soleado, I pulled alongside Lily, though I was careful to take it slow. At 29 feet, Chico was able to handle the reef better than a scooter four times its length, but I still didn't want to take any risks. I tied us to Lily's transom, which was the least damaged part of her, and then hopped on board. Just like with Soleado, the crew was all bunched below decks, this time in the captain's cabin. Which told me right there that there were supernatural forces at work. Meg didn't let anyone in her cabin for any reason. In related news, the place was a mess and smelled kind of funky. I got the same litany of family members that they, they thought they'd never see again. From Meg's brother in Boston, to the chief's mate's children in Norf Norfolk, to the cook's husband and kids in New York to the engineer's parents in San Francisco, and so on. Just like Soleado, and just like that song. Cole showed up soon enough, as did two other boats. He regarded me with concern. This is some very bizarre stuff happening, Cassie. You ain't kidding. That night, I returned to the Botroff house, where I shared my room with the ghost of the wrecker captain, who originally built the place, Captain Jeremiah Botroff. As a Deese, I was the only person who could see or hear the captain, which meant I pretty much got stuck with his company, since I'd been his only regular source of conversation for the past century and a half. I got to see how your job used to be today, I said as I climbed into bed. And how's that exactly? Botroff asked. I told him about Lily, as well as Soleado, and I threw in Larry's fish story while I was at it, which prompted a derisive snort from Botroff. If he didn't tow the vessel back to shore, if he didn't claim salvage of a percentage of its cargo in exchange for rescuing them, then what you did was nothing, like my own travails as a wrecker. Back in the 19th century, wreckers like Botroff would rescue boats that crashed on reefs and then do all that stuff he just said. When I first got here, I thought that meant he was a pirate, but it was actually all completely legal and seriously regulated. The practice faded away as boat construction improved to the point where those kinds of wrecks weren't everyday occurrences. Yeah, the Coasties handled the really fun parts. Actually... Patrov said. Your story of the vessel Soleado does have a ring of familiarity to it, as does your immortal friend's tale of woe. I, too, encountered a vessel that claimed to have seen mermaids. They, too, babbled about their homes and family. At the time, I dismissed them as madmen, but in light of what I've seen in the days since my death... So what happened? In truth, I only recall the incident, not due to the fatuous ramblings of the passengers and crew, but because I was forbidden from claiming salvage. The boat did not actually come upon a reef, nor was it damaged in any way. Rather, it was adrift, and while we did indeed tow them back to shore, the judge denied our salvage claim. As you can imagine, my boys and I were rather upset. That night, I dreamed of a mermaid swimming around one of Seacliff's boats, with me and Larry and the guitar player on it, and I started wishing I could see my parents back in La Jolla again. Since I still hadn't seen the thing, my brain decided to make the mermaid look like the Disney char character Ariel from The Little, Mer Little Mermaid. The next day I was working at the B&B &B all day, with no dives to run, and that night I headed to the open mic at Mayor Fred's. Larry was there, of course, as was Ginny. The drummer in 1812, as well as being a Norse god and the ex-wife of the trickster Loki, Ginny had been encouraged by the rest of the band to do some singing in addition to her excellent drum work. She wanted to try it at the open mic first, and if she was comfortable with it, she'd sing with the band on stage. Their already impressive repertoire of covers and harmonies would be increased greatly by adding a fourth voice to the mix. Because Ginny was there, a third familiar face sat at the bar. Loki, who was trying, and so far, to my delight, 
failing to win Jenny back. Loki greeted me with the supercilious smile he always used. Larry informs me that you encountered a Hobstra. I blinked. Then I remembered my crash course in Norse myth that I imposed upon myself after learning I was a Dees eight months ago. Right, that's what you guys called mermaids. In a manner of speaking, in truth, the only reason Hofstra have been seen on Midgard or Asgard is because of a little joke I played on Thor once. You see, he had just married Sif, even though I kept telling her my cousin would have sexual congress with virtually any female he could get his hands on. To prove his lack of faithfulness, I summoned a Hofstra from one another of the Nine Worlds, and Thor did indeed attempt to ravish her. I let out a long breath. Let me guess, the sky is emerald green on that particular world? Oh, I believe so, yes. Loki grinned. Sadly, in the end, no one was happy. The Hafsara only wished to go home. Sif was furious at me for starting it all, and as for Thor, he faced certain logistical difficulties. I chuckled and shook my head. Couldn't fit Tab A into slot B? Well, Hafsara has no uh, slot B as such. Sif forced me to send the creature back, and I did. I suppose it's possible others of a kind have slipped between the worlds and arrived here. Just to board ships and make them act weird? That doesn't make sense. Jenny was walking up to the mic now and started singing an a cappella song called Seven Bridges Road, which was pretty much ended the conversation. Enraptured, Loki watched her sing the song in a lovely alto, and he clapped the loudest when she was done. To be fair, I clapped the second loudest. She absolutely nailed it. When she came back to the bar to hearty congratulations from me, Larry, Loki, and the entire rest of the bar, I asked her, why didn't you sing before? I must confess, Cassie, that at this moment I cannot imagine why. Loki smiled. I always knew you had a voice that could move the heavens themselves, Sigyn. Thank you. I shook my head. On the one hand, Loki was a prime asshole. On the other hand, he really did love Jenny. Two days later, I was in Harpo, taking three sisters back from a dive near some lovely coral, when I saw a sea lion swim by the boat. It scared the hell out of me at first, but I got a good look at it, and it was an actual sea lion. I found myself remembering the jokes about sea lions being mermaid dogs. Just after I caught my breath and recovered, I saw another sea lion tail, but it was green. And then the head popped out, and it looked kind of like a person? The face was more or less feminine, with hair that extended down past her shoulders, but looked a lot like a pelt. The tail was definitely that of a sea creature, and the head looked like a woman with funny hair, although her eyes were wide enough to qualify as an anime character. She didn't have his nose so much as two slits above her upper lip, and her lips were huge and full, but the weird part was her body. She had a flexible torso that didn't look like a sea lion or a woman. No boobs, no obvious thorax, just a stretch of skin and bone that linked the head to the tail. Two arms grew out of that torso, with no elbows, but ending with three-fingered hands, complete with opposable thumbs. I also realized I couldn't see her skin directly. It was wet and matted and short, but her entire body was covered with the green pelt, making her appear a tiny bit like a green polar bear. She was holding something in one hand that looked like a heavily serrated blade, and a glass ball in the other. I shook my head. There's your glass and comb from the song. Wow, she's beautiful. That was one of the sisters who obviously had a different definition of beautiful than mine. Then again, the creature might have been using a glamour to appear more attractive to whoever's looking at her. After all, most of the mermaid stories, from Columbus to Captain Botroff to Larry to the Walt Disney Company, have them all looking pretty. And if they saw what I was seeing, they wouldn't think that. Anyhow, the mermaid, or whatever it was, burst through the surface just like a sea lion and flopped onto the deck of Harpo. Then she just stared at us. The sky turned emerald green the same color as the mermaid's pelt. The three sisters ran below decks and crammed themselves into the head. I didn't move. I felt something in my head, a weird longing, and an overwhelming sense of wanting to be back in La Jolla. No, no, that wasn't it. The images in my head were of the house I grew up in outside San Diego, but I wasn't thinking of the house specifically. I was thinking about home. I need to go home. But that wasn't me thinking that, even though the thought was in my head. After, I real after a minute, I realized it was the mermaid who wanted to go home. Fuck me. How can I get you home? You understand me. Finally, someone who understands me. I guess I do, yeah. Are you of the Aesir? I snorted. That was what Odin, Thor, Loki, and the other Norse gods like to call themselves. Sorta? Their trickster kidnapped our sister once. 
and since then the boundaries between the worlds have weakened. Sometimes we fall into this world and must find our way home to our sisters. I miss them so. She slithered toward me on the deck, and I saved her some trouble by moving toward her as I approached. She held up the glass ball. This talisman may return me home, but they do not function. May I? Of course. I took the ball, but I had no idea what it was, really, or what it did, and me holding it had no effect on it. Sometimes when I touched something, it acted weird, but not this time. Have I mentioned I didn't get an instruction manual? Howsomever, I knew someone who could help. My name is Cassie. I'm one of the Deseer. I'm acquainted with the trickster who kidnapped your sister back in the day, and I can learn from him how to get you home. Can you meet me back here later tonight, say in six hours? Very well. And thank you, Dees. My pleasure. I handed her the ball back. The mermaid, or I guess Havsura, took it and then dove back over the side of the boat. I ran down to the head where the three women were just sitting there. My husband's back home in Philadelphia. I'll never see him again. My daughter's back home in Perth Amboy. I'll never see her again. My wife's back home in Tarrytown. I'll never see her again. I sighed. I knew I forgot to ask the hops for something. That night, I went to Mayor Fred's, where 1812 was playing with a full band, including Ginny on drums, which meant Loki was in the audience. I walked in, grabbed his ear, and dragged him out onto Green Street. Ow! Uh, what, what are you doing, little Dees? He only called me that when he wanted to piss me off. We'd already done that more. He'd already done that more than he realized. In April, when it snowed and the world was almost destroyed, that was your fault. Last month, when the ghosts on the island got super active and everyone could see and hear them, and one of them killed people, that was your fault. And now Hamstra are causing shipwrecks and have been for centuries. Guess what? Your fault, again! What the fuck is wrong with you? How is this my fault, exactly? He asked archly. I told him what the Hamstra had told me. His voice much more subdued with all the high dudgeon gone. He said, Ah, I see. Sadly, Cassie, I cannot help you. While the spell itself is rather simple, it takes great power to bridge the gap between the worlds to send the Havstra home. I am but a shadow of my former self. Even when the peoples of Northern Europe worshipped the Aesir as gods and my power was at its absolute height, it was difficult for me to manage it. Now there is no chance of it. She has two talismans, a glass ball and a multi-bladed knife of some kind. I know not what the knife would do, but the glass ball is likely an orb, which can focus magic very much the way a lens focuses light. Well, that will merely direct the spell, not create it. Fine, you said the spell was simple. Teach it to me. I know I've got the mojo. I grinned. How do you think I stopped you? Raising a blonde eyebrow, he then said, And what reason do I have to beg you to do you this kindness? I blinked. I beg your pardon. What boon shall you grant me in exchange for doing you this service? For a moment, I just stared at him. My parents have a word for what you just, just did. It's chutzpah. And if you really want a boon, how about this? I won't have to tell Ginny that you were a total douche nozzle when I asked you to help me out. On the other hand, if you do help me, I could tell the woman you're trying to win back that you selflessly helped me get a Havstra back home. He seemed to consider it, but I knew him well enough at this point to know damn well he wouldn't do anything to jeopardize his chances with softening Ginny toward him. Very well. Shall we retire to your dwelling? I sighed. The notion of Loki in my room did not appeal, but the Havstra needed to get home before somebody got hurt. So we went back to the Botroff house, and over the strenuous objections of the captain, had a spellcasting tutoring session. The language of the spell was in the same unrecognizable tongue as the spell I used to stop Loki in April, which helped me pick up the cadence faster. Once we were done, and I was sure I had the spell's words and proper pronunciation memorized, Loki said, Excellent! Good luck, Cassie. Oh, I'm going to have more than luck. You're coming with me. But, but me no buts, butthead. I'm not taking any chances, and I need backup, even if it's just... I shook my head, laughing at the irony even as I said it. <laughs> For moral support. Loki grinned. Not my usual type of support, I must say. We drove out to Stock Island. I had already convinced my bosses at Sea Clips to let me take one of the boats out on my own, on the condition that I pay for the gas used on the trip. Luckily, there were only enough evening dive sign-ups for one boat, so they had two to spare. Loki and I went out in Groucho. He looked really nauseated as we went, and by the time we reached the rendezvous spot, he was almost as green as the Havstra. Speaking of whom, she was waiting for us in the same place as planned. She once again flopped onto the deck. I am glad you returned, Dees. I was not sure you would. Our experiences with the Aesir are not ones that engender trust. She was looking right at Loki. 
So was I. You know who this is? True, I'd said that I'd be consulting Loki, but he was a shape changer, and I doubt he looked the same now as he did when he kidnapped your sister in order to tweak Thor and Sif. We are well aware of the trickster who ripped our sister from us. My apologies, sweet lady. Loki bowed and almost came close to sounding like he was trying to be sincere. I was young and foolish and was poor at thinking through the consequences of my actions. And you're using the past tense why exactly? Now Loki gave me a look. Shall we begin? The Hopsra handed me the orb. You will need this. Thank you. I took the orb from her and then started to chant the familiar words in the unfamiliar language. As I spoke, I felt something tug at my heart, and the orb started to glow from within. The sky turned green, and a small whirlpool started forming in the water just off our port bow. Thank you, Cassie of the Desir. You have the eternal gratitude of the Havstra for what you have done today. Then she turned to Loki and held up the knife that the sea shanty writers had mistaken for a comb. And thank you also for allowing us to at last have our vengeance. With that, she slashed Loki's throat with the blades. Blood started spurting all over the deck, and Loki fell to his knees, a total look of surprise on his face. I grabbed him and eased him down to the deck. Turning to the hamster, I cried, What the fuck? Since the day our sister was returned to us from Asgard, after being wretchedly ill-treated by the Aesir, we have traveled with two items in our possession. These were to be used if we fell through one of the many portals between words that this trickster created for his sport and for our agony. The orb could be used to return us home, though it does not always function as it should. The blade was to be used to avenge our sister for her mistreatment of his foul creature's hands, should we ever be fortunate enough to cross his path once again. Goodbye, Cassie of the Desir. Fare you well. And goodbye, Loki of the Aesir. Fare you poorly. And then she dove over the railing and into the whirlpool, which closed up behind her, the water becoming still once again. Loki stared upward. The sun was starting to set, painting the sky a spectacular orange and purple. His voice a gurgling croak. He said, Sigyn is, is back in Key West. I'll never see her beautiful face again. Then he just faded away. Seriously, he went transparent and then disappeared. Even the blood he got all over Groucho's deck was gone, which, if nothing else, meant I wouldn't be stuck cleaning it up. Gods don't die the way we do, even if they, if they even really die at all. But right now, Loki was gone. How the fuck was I going to explain this to Ginny? I sat completely alone on the deck, the orb rolling around next to me as Groucho bounced with the tide. Whilst the raging seas do roar, and the lofty winds do blow, and we poor seamen do lie on the top, while the landman lies below. The end. Uh, Out of Tune is available from Journal Stone Press. Um, as is its follow-up volume, which I don't have a story in, but it's also very good, and I recommend both anthologies very much. There's some great stories in them. Uh, so do check them out. You can check me out online at decandido.net, read my blog at decandido.wordpress.com, and uh, support me on patreon.com slash cred, if you would. That would be really wonderful. Um, we'll be back Wednesday with the next Cassie story in this week's sequence, which is called Seven Mile Race, uh, which features more Norse gods, but... and. So anyway, see you then, and please stay safe.